Hello and welcome to another A Tippling Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan M. S. Pierce. Lots going on today, and I will try and give you as good a frontline update as I can. But this is the morning in the UK, and fighting will be going on as we speak in Ukraine. So this is prime time for things to change really, really quickly. Apologies if this is already out of date to some degree, but there's always a nuggets part that comes second. Uh, a couple of uh, sort of housekeeping notes. Uh, I did, My channel is primor primarily a, a philosophy channel. So if you get on your feed a bunch of my philosophy videos coming up and when I do lives and these, these ones to do with, you know, the meaning of life, what morality is, whether or not God exists, all that kind of stuff. If you don't like it, just ignore it, right? It's really difficult to split channels and I'd lose basically my entire audience for one of them and have to start it up again it's something i might consider it depends how long this campaign goes this war goes on uh, but i do have those other other videos just ignore them if they're not your bag if they are your bag whoop de doo um uh, so yeah, there, there is that. And, uh, thank you so much to people who have jumped on board just recently. So as there are new people coming on board, I will have to repeat myself on certain points that I've made in previous videos. Uh, I do apologize for those who have heard it all before, but it's worth repeating some of these important points, uh, so that you understand the full context of what's going on. Um, with all that in mind, let's get to the front line. Uh, here we have the map of the whole region. Let's just go. It's basically all happening in Kherson, much more than it is in the Oskar River area, where there's been a slowing down. And some analysts are saying it's a bit of a worry because actually the momentum is really in uh, Ukraine's favor. And you want to be chasing the tails of the Russians as they, with uh, as they withdraw or, or retreat. Uh, but they are being fairly slow and methodical. The flip side is that there could be very good reason for doing that and make sure all the logistics are sorted out, making sure uh, that your troops are doing what they're supposed to be doing and being where they're supposed to be. And, you know, there'll, there'll be plans and strategies and tactics and all that uh, going on. So it, it's difficult to try and second guess, isn't it? Um, but there you go. That's what that's what I've been doing the whole time, trying to second guess. OK, so let's have a look at what's going on in in this in this northern northeastern region. Here you have uh, some advances going on sort of in the Kupiansk area going towards Svatove. Uh, and then you have stuff going on down near Kremina. Uh, so this is, let's go down to Kremina first. Uh, this was the map I showed you the other day. What has happened since then is there's been a very slow advance of the Ukrainian forces towards um, these settlements. So they've taken these settlements now as far as I can work out. And there is this place, the... Chivanopopivka, uh, where they have uh, advanced across the P66, but not across the Krasna River. There's a tiny little river here, or a river here. However, in uh, Krasna Rychensky, they have uh, bridged the river, so to speak, and and their, their their advance here is not only over the P66, but over uh, the the river, the Krasna River as well. So I'll. I'll I'll uh, reflect that in um, having a look here. So just to let you know, what, what I'm zooming into this area here, which is Kremina and the uh, krasno uh, little town there. And the idea that just here, the Ukrainians have um, gone east of the P66, but not east of the river. And here they've gone east of both. Uh, to get a foothold. So here you've got um, Kremina. So that's Kremina there. If I give you the the sort of basic map so you can get your bearings first before I go and look at the terrain. So you've got Kremina there. Uh, you've got um, Chivano Pivka here. And you've got a river that sort of runs here. And then I think it sort of uh, goes around there. Oh, no, it goes around here. I think it splits in two. But we'll see that in a second. And it's here that the Ukrainians have not only gone over the P66, but the river to get their bridgehead. And from there, they'll be able to, this will be their launch pad for coming around east and circling around the cities if that's what their intentions are. Okay, so there you go. Um, let's have a look at the terrain then. So if we go in, this is Kremina. And we have the Krasna River that sort of goes through Kremina. Uh, it comes up here and up here. And Chernopivka. Uh, Pipivka, Chernopivka, yeah, 
There you go. Anyway, that, that is now in Ukrainian hands, and the Krasna River is here. It comes up here. They haven't crossed the river here. However, the river does come up, uh, uh, and uh, I think sort of goes two ways there, and it is uh, Krasna Rachensky that the Ukrainians hold. So they've crossed the river here and hold this settlement. And that is going to be a useful sort of bridgehead for them and a useful launching pad. So that's basically what's going up, uh, going on in the um, in the uh, Kremlin area. Going further up north, they've made some slow advances, and Svatova here is still, you know, holding out. They haven't really made an advance on Svatova. What I told you the other day is that Svatova actually sits. Uh, in in a kind of dip, there's some bluffs to the western side of Svatova. Basically, this higher ground around here will be really useful for artillery for obvious reasons. If your artillery is higher up, it has a longer range. So actually, from around here, you can you know do quite a lot of damage to areas here in terms of you know your tactics and being able to have fire control over a larger area. So actually, I would imagine once Svatova is properly you know, either encircled or even, you know, they start knocking on the doors. I don't think Svato will last long. I think the the Luhansk militia that, that holds it primarily will not be long for that area uh, and they'll be retreat to Starobilsk. So that's what's happening there. Not a huge amount of movement, but uh, a little bit. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to concentrate on the Donetsk uh, and, and northern uh, southern Luhansk area uh, front line today because I just don't have time. But I really want to focus on this area. There is stuff happening, but it is a bit to and fro. The Ukrainians did try a sort of counteroffensive here. I'm not sure that it got particularly far, but I will try and do some research and look into that. It's just a matter of time. So let's go back. Uh, and again, Zaporizhia, not a lot going on. Let's go to the Kherson front where quite a lot is going on. And we have quite a bit to, to think about in terms of this area. So here is uh, the gif of, of what's happened over the last few days. You've just seen a, a, a very quick advance that went sort of 20 kilometers originally to Duchani and now appears to be moving to Milove. And there's this front across from Milove that is. Well, that was what it was where it was at yesterday. There is now rumor on social media that Bereslav has either been taken or has been advanced upon. If that is the case, if that's actually happened, that is a massive blow for the Ukrainian uh, for the uh, Russians because um, let's look at this map because Bereslav uh, and Kozatsky are on the right-hand side of the river, so you always talk about right and left in terms of where the river is flowing. So the river is flowing down here towards the sea through Kherson. This is the right-hand side of the river. So the right bank of the river, you have uh, Kozatsky as the entry point to this bridge, this dam, um, sorry, and the road that goes across it to Novokohovka, which then provides the fresh water to uh, Crimea. This is a key uh, objective for the Ukrainians. And in fact, there there is some people that are saying, right, really, we could have the Russians being split in two, and retreating to protect Kherson here, and the Antonovsky Bridge, which goes across here, uh, and the and Novokovka. So you could have two areas of Russian resistance or, or defence operating there uh, at the moment. The Elsewhere, the Ukrainians are just making super gains uh, really quickly. So at, what I definitely know is that you've got this front from Milove right across here to uh, Bruskinsky. That uh, is, is, is definite. The rumours are that Bereslav could have fallen or certainly knocking on that door. Now, if that's the case, just this morning, it's a massive amount of, uh, of ground that's been taken. Uh, we talked about what could be happening, that communications could be being broken, that we could have uh, Ukrainians uh, in Russian vehicles with V and Z on or Z, and that 
they've got trackers in the vehicle. So Ukrainians have the tech to know who's on their side, but the Russians don't. So they're looking at vehicles thinking, oh, they're, they're Russian vehicles, but they're not. They're actually Ukrainian. So a bit of deception could be going on there. That's that's one rumor that's come from the Russians themselves, actually. Um, and the, there's just so much lightning quick stuff uh, with poor communications. They can't get, uh, they can't communicate with HQ to get air support or artillery support. So the villages are falling really very quickly. Okay, the latest news as well is that this uh, little settlement here, Snihirivka, has now fallen to the Ukrainians. So that's just sort of happened. Here's my little map. So Milobay, right across uh, to Bruskinski, and then Kostromka, that's, uh, that fell to the, or that was liberated by the uh, Ukrainians. Uh, yesterday and now this has been liberated so snihirivka uh, and and if that's the case then you know you're going to get start getting pincer movement going on as they come down the right bank of the of the river and from here and you know you either the russians are just going to pull out wholesale from here or they're going to get encircled and obviously if they're going to get encircled they're in trouble um this is just some of the rumors. So you, again, this is absolutely not confirmed. Ukraine broke uh, the shaky and hasty line at Milove and now has taken Berislav and can control southwest and pin uh, Russia against the Inhuletz River and Berislav is within range, easily for Ukrainian artillery to cover all over Novokovka. Russia cannot resupply its trap forces in Kherson at all. Uh, the 126th... Um, uh, BDE, it's a Russian uh, um, division, uh, I think, has has gone. He, so this guy says. Um, referring also to another person who said the Russian sources now tell the defensive line uh, towards Berislav is broken and that the Ukrainian units are pushing to the city from two sides, already north and east. They also say that there's nearly nothing left of the 126th Brigade. Sorry, Brigade. Um and and this is Google Translate of uh, Russian Telegram channels. A seventy sixth Guards Air Assault Division. The enemy leaves no hope of reaching Berislav along the Dnieper. Uh, presses from both sides. I think that's just a slight mistranslation there. From the north, a real meat grinder has already pushed through there. There is nothing we can do to help. So uh, the battle, uh, nothing to do to help. The battle defense line broken. 126 is no more. The remnants of the brigade are attached to our operational subordination. So 126 has joined the 76th, as according to this. But of course, you know, that's just someone on Twitter, okay? That would need to be verified. It, it, it has not been, but it it's going to happen, right? It's not, it's not as if that's a wild claim. The, the, the Ukrainians are marching really quickly down here, and it wouldn't surprise me if Berislav has has fallen because what it's what nine thirty in the UK, they would have had three or four hours worth of of activity already. And the great thing for the Ukrainian uh, forces is that they have night vision goggles and night vision technology that they've been supplied by NATO and their allies. This has actually been the case for for a whole load of months, uh, a long time. Where the Russians don't. I mean, the Russians are struggling to get winter gear at the moment. The Ukrainians can operate and have been operating at night in the Kherson region, where the Russians have been unable to do so, or comparatively unable to do so. Okay, so it looks like you might have end up having two um, defensive lines for for the Russians. Depends how quickly everything happens here, uh, but that that would be they would want to keep hold of Novokovka and and Kherson. It, Novokovka is going to be in artillery range very, very soon, if not already, um, certainly with the longer range artillery. So they're in trouble. Something else that's worth saying here, that uh, the better that Ukraine do in the Kherson region, but actually this is something that can be said about the whole of the front line, right? the better that, that Ukraine do here, the more concentrated the Russian forces become, the harder they become to break down. So, you know, you you become a victim of your own success in a sense, right? So what's happened here, so in the Kherson um, region, is that this front line, as it was, 
just in this area here, right, has gone from 80 kilometers to now 40 kilometers from Milove to Bruskansky. Taking that from 80 kilometers to 40 kilometers means that you have the same amount of Russian forces, broadly speaking, to cover half the area, which means the troops per, per kilometer are now du is, are doubled. This means that, as I say, you've got a greater uh, concentration of defensive forces and it becomes harder to break them down. So the smaller this area becomes, the harder it is to make uh, further inroads into, into the defence. And actually, you, could, you can say that about the whole of the front line. What the problem that the Russians have had, and this, was, this is what underwrote the issues up in, in this northern Luhansk area in the Kharkiv uh, lightning uh, counteroffensive, is that this is, this is a massive, massive front line, right? Well, I mean, we're talking about, goodness knows, thousands of kilometres. The Russian forces are not strong enough to hold all of this realistically what you'd want is basically an equal distribution forgetting the fact that there are towns and places but just thinking in a real abstract sense you want equal distribution of forces all the way along your defensive lines if you don't then wherever you have fewer forces and troops you will have a weak point that will be exploited by the enemy right so in this case they had a real weak Point, a load of weak points up here that you had fewer troops, in fact, at times military police, Rodskvardia, and you had very poor quality troops. And so this was where the Ukrainians exploited. Okay, they the Russians didn't have enough troops to properly man all defensively the, the entire front line. And as a result, they got defeated in this area. And that will continue happening for as long as they don't have enough troops. And the Russians just don't have enough troops. They are mobilizing. Again, we've talked a lot about that. Is the quality going to be there? Is the training going to be there? Is the equipment going to be there? They, they, they will be more boots on the, on the ground, but will they actually be a disadvantage in certain contexts because of all those problems? This front line is, is just too much for the Russians to cope with. And that's just talking defensively. So now when you talk about offensively, I mean, at the moment, they're really only on the offensive in the Bakhmut area and a little bit further south. Here, they, they are making, what, metres a day? If, you, if you're talking about, about this over, uh, over the last few months, the Russians are struggling offensively because they don't have the troops to adequately attack. They are on the defence now. And they don't have the troops to satisfactorily defend the front line they do. What this then means is, as I've mentioned, they can be exploited by the, the Ukrainians, but it means that the Ukrainians hold the initiative. The, the, the Ukrainians are dictating where and when things are being attacked. And this, this is really significant because it, it shows that the Ukraine, Ukrainian forces are controlling the war, the conflict. The Russians do not have strength in depth. They have strength in depth probably around here. Most elsewhere, as soon as you break through their front lines, they are, they are, there's nothing. This is particularly the case up in this Luhansk area and the Oskil River area. As soon as they punch through, there's nothing behind there. These are just manned by very weak militia. Okay, down in Kherson, there is arguably a strength in depth, but as soon as they're Punch, as soon as that front line is punched through, even that strength is, you know, panicking and running away and being forced into smaller and smaller regions. The control is in the hands of the Ukrainians at the moment, and the Russians do not have the troops to be able to attack, and they do not have the troops to be able to defend a massive front line. Um, there you go. So that that's what's been happening. This is a dynamic front. This will change by the time you you get this. It'll probably be out of date. But that's that that's where it goes. I, I don't know if I'll have time to do a second update today uh, due to work commitments and whatnot. But hopefully uh, that's good enough for now. And now on to some nuggets.
Okay, the first thing I'm going to direct you toward is uh, an article I wrote back in April uh, for Only Sky, Only Sky Media. Um, uh, the article is entitled, Where to now, Putin? Because there is no way you can win. I'm not going to talk about this article today, but I'm going to probably do talk about it tomorrow or a future day because I'm interested as to whether I was correct in April and whether there is no way that Putin can win and whether all my points broadly hold still. Uh, and my guess is, well, I'm, I'm fairly sure it's still entirely correct and that Putin cannot win. Uh, and there was no way he could could win even from the start because they made the wrong calculation at the beginning. And as soon as the country of Ukraine doesn't want uh, Russia to be there, you become an occupying force. And there's absolutely no way that Russia can successfully occupy a country of that size. The only thing they could do is destroy it, and then they own this country that's destroyed. Um, but even they, they would struggle to even do that. So, like, the whole war was started with faulty premises, and from there on, there's literally nothing he could do to win because he has um, burnt all his bridges internationally, domestically, economically. There is just no way that Putin can win. He's absolutely one of the worst decisions decisions in modern history. Anyway, th that was what I said back in April, and I'm fairly sure it entirely holds. I'll put a link to that article below. You guys can have a look at it if you want and see if I am still correct or uh, whether I'm wrong or whether I was wrong before. Who knows? Okay, nuclear war. So I think yesterday it, it came out uh, through Russian sources on Telegram, and this tells you a lot, that the Russians were moving a nuclear train, okay, on the way to its western border. This is pretty interesting. Uh, uh, rare video shows Russia moving equipment belonging to a nuclear weapons unit. This has got a lot of people really worried because they're thinking, okay, this is the beginning of nuclear preparations so that Russia uh, can start, you know, being able to use nuclear warheads. I'm not going to go into all the problems with them doing that, but I'm interested in, first of all, the notion that this came from a Russian source on Twitter. In other words, oh, I'm sorry, in Telegram. In other words, Russia wanted the world to know about this. I, I'm interested in, in the notion that this is actually just nuclear saber rattling. This is, um, in my opinion, Putin flexing his muscles. This, uh, and this is what Andy Skolik says here. This could well be signaling as part of Russia's nuclear bluffing coercion tactics. It would have been possible to transport these vehicles under tarpaulins, at least. The intention may well be to be seen, but there's always going to be a but. Satellite uh, and Sajint, uh, so intelligence, do your stuff. Um, uh, yes, this could, this could be doing both, right? It could be not only communicating to what we've got nuclear capabilities and we're not afraid to use them but also preparing to use them yeah sure but i i'm i'm of the view that this is saber rattling again uh just a continuation of the threats that that he's previously um used and this is putin basically calling the west bluff again because hitherto four it if it has failed okay he he has the west hasn't really descended into um chaos and worry and panic over russia using its nuclear capabilities in fact what the west has done has been very robust in its reply and and the us and nato have directly said to uh, russia what will happen if they do do that and there's a lot of thought to say that um, actually, we will retaliate with conventional warfare and we'll just sink the Black Sea Fleet. And the problem with using nuclear is if Russia is going to use nu a nuclear weapon, a tactical nuke on the battlefield, maybe, I don't know, five tactical nukes, then they're covering the battlefield with radiation. Then their troops have to go in. The very strong chance of them being radiated uh, and getting radiation poisoning and it being not as useful for Putin as he'd like from a tactical point of view. Then if you talk about from an international response point of view, he would just be absolutely, I'm, sh I'm fairly sure the Russian forces would be just obliterated, at least in part, 
in certain areas. Take, for example, the Black Sea Fleet. And so, therefore, there will be absolutely no point in him doing that. Uh, you could also have a coup. You, the weapons could be taken out in midair. They could be taken out before they're even fired because we know exactly where their nuclear capabilities are housed. So there are so many problems with the whole nuclear approach. And it's just, um, I think this is just another case of saber rattling. Okay, let's move on. Uh, boxes with golden... T now, again, this is on social media. Who knows if this is true? But there is a box of golden teeth here. Boxes with golden teeth were found on Russian positions in the towns liberated by Ukrainian forces. American soldiers found similar boxes when they liberated the Buchenwald concentration camp. If this is not genocide, then what is? Uh, I don't know if it counts as genocide, but certainly uh, it appears that the Russians have been possibly taking gold teeth out of dead soldiers and civilians' mouths um, because there's gold and it's worth money. Uh, and here's an example of someone doing it on a personal front, a dead Russian soldier in Ukraine who apparently looted gold teeth from a Ukrainian who was likely to have been alive, uh, so someone notes. Um, uh, there you go. Uh, a nice crucifix there because obviously that's maybe that's stolen as well. Um, gold, whether it comes to someone's mouth or someone's de dead mouth or alive, it, live is more of a problem obviously, but if it comes from someone's dead mouth or from their house, you know, this is this is looting, uh, and it's a war crime. Okay, lend lease. People hear about this term an awful lot. What is lend lease, and what just what's going on there with the Americans doing this whole lend lease thing? Well, actually, lend lease first started in the uh, First World War. Uh, sorry, Second World War, and it was the way uh, that the American government were able to help the Allied forces, including the Soviet Union, without getting involved in the war, so remaining neutral, like technically neutral. So uh, the revival of the Lend-Lease has enormous historical resonance as the 1941 initiative was a crucial factor enabling Allied victory in World War II. Stalin himself credited Lend-Lease, which benefited Great Britain, France, China, and the Soviet Union with winning the war. In fact, one-fifth of the uh, American Lend-Lease uh, resources went to the Soviet Union. They supplied the Soviet Union with, a, I mean, that's the irony now, with a whole load of stuff, sheet metal, food, weaponry, armaments, and, and that enabled them to compete against uh, against the Nazis. As Stalin's successor as Soviet leader, leader Nikita Khrushchev wrote, I would like to recall some remarks Stalin made and repeated several times that when we were discussing freely among ourselves. He stated bluntly that if the United States had not helped us, we would not have won the war. If we had had to fight Nazi Germany one to one-on-one, one on one, we could not have stood up to Germany's pressure and we would have lost the war. lend was not used uh, later in a couple of other times, but it is being used in Ukraine after 75 years. It's now set to be revived, so this was written some time ago, to ensure Ukraine repels the largest attack on European states since 1945. Aims to thwart a dictator whose explicit ambition to destroy Ukraine as a state and a nation echoes the criminal goals of Hitler and Stalin. So there are some interesting parallels here. Uh, the the Lend-Lease plan um, is, is something that allows uh, America to, or the US to, supply arms whilst not having to go through the proper paperwork if you like so here i'll just quote from the conversation another issue is that some of the heavier weapons uh um artillery armored vehicles and air defense systems require some training of ukrainian forces before they can be used in battle there are also legal and procedural issues the president can only spend funds appropriated by congress and if weapons are sold or transferred to ukraine they are subject to the uh, fsa the foreign assistance act and the arms export control act the ae CA. The FSA puts strict human rights conditions on the provisions provision of both non-military and military aid. The AECA requires certification by countries of receiving arms or military technology that weapons are used either for internal security or self-defense and will not be used to escalate a conflict. These requirements create bureaucratic obstacles to eat arms shipment and given the ambiguous phrasing of the law and the fluid nature of the conflict in Ukraine potentially put US manufacturers at risk of prosecution. The solution by the Biden administration is to introduce a new Lend-Lease agreement is a very imaginative way to get around some of these bureaucratic and procedural issues which could otherwise risk significant delays to the delivery of this aid. So basically uh, it, this specifies that arms deliveries to Ukraine are exempt from various conditions laid down by the two acts related to human rights conditions and the requirement 
government to pay for weapons and other assistance provided. So it, when push comes to shove, you don't want, I mean, human rights are absolutely magnificent, obviously, but you, you don't want to get that kind of bureaucracy to get in the way of being able to get stuff to Ukraine as quickly as possible, because in the, at the end of the day, that, that will be better for human rights as a whole. Uh, the basic principle of lend is that arms supplies are not sold or donated, but rather provided on the basis that they will eventually be returned to the United States. But in this case, the US government is bypassing the usual re- regulations governing such transactions by accepting that there is no guarantee that any of the equipment will actually be returned or paid for after the end of the conflict. The administration expects that the new law will considerably reduce the delay on weapons actually re- reaching the Ukraine military, and as it has. And in fact, uh, the Brit- uh, Britannica uh, Encyclopedia Britannica says that um, this legislation, this is a 1941 one, gave the president the author- the authority to aid any nation whose defence he believed vital to the United States and to accept repayment quote in kind or property or any other direct or indirect benefit which the president deems satisfactory. In other words, the US can give all this aid and. A f- not really expect it to be given back it's kind of a donation it's a lend lease but you can pay us in kind or if if the benefits of of giving you this stuff are really obvious then that's that's the payment for doing that so anyway that's a little uh, bit of, of stuff on the lend lease okay bulgaria i talked to you the other day about how bulgaria is using its arms factories to or no i said it in a comment actually on a, in a youtube comment on one of my videos that bulgaria is 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 one of the nations who's really supporting um ukraine in very meaningful ways but uh, they have ramped up the the manufacture of soviet era munitions so they because ukraine is using a load of soviet stuff and we've given them all the soviet stuff that we can get hold of in from, from eastern europe and there's nothing left to give them basically they are running out of munitions stuff to fire in the in the soviet um artillery or the russian artillery so Bulgaria has actually ramped up production of the older stuff or uh, all, all the, the ex-Soviet stuff. And this has been fantastic. However, the S- Russian secret services are getting involved. The FSB, uh, they, uh, they've blown up um, a factory or part of a factory. Suspicious explosion occurred at Arsenal, which is a, a Bulgarian arms manufacturer, um, produces Soviet ammunition for the Ukrainian army. Three people were killed and others injured in the explosion. And this is not the first time. So Russia are getting involved in trying to stop Bulgaria supporting Ukraine. That's really important. Okay. Uh, I talked to you yesterday about uh, four trucks, just a picture saying here are four trucks that are captured by the Ukrainians. This is really good because those four trucks cannot no longer be used for um, supplying the Russians every day, not just for one day, but every day that, that those will be used. So those four trucks... It's a massive loss, just that one picture of those four trucks or four different pictures. Someone said on, on, on a thread, it's not just that. It's a zero-sum game here. So it's those four trucks are not just use, unable to be used by the Russians. They are now used by the Ukrainians. So it's a game. But not only that, here, here's an example of the truck being full of ammunition. And not only have they captured that truck, that truck can't be used to supply Russian forces, but quite often, all the stuff on board can now be used by Ukrainians against the Russians. So all of these munitions, rounds, artillery shells, whatever, can now be used against the Russians. Okay. Ukrainian 28th Brigade claim to have downed a Russian Eleron 3 UAV. So these are uh, reconnaissance drones that will uh, spot for artillery or, or just do general intelligence. Uh, and this was done with a EDM-4SC UAV gun. In other words, it's kind of like a ray gun, if you like, pointing at uh, at the sky, and it's electronic warfare, and it will bring down things like drones. And this is happening quite a lot. Now, the reason I've, I've mentioned this one is because it's funded by a charity. Okay, so you get these private funding. So the Czechs have just bought a tank. It is an old T-60, uh, no, T-72, but it's been updated. And and they've bought that a charity. Let's raise a bunch of money. The uh, was it the Latvians or was it the Lithu- Lithuanians? I think uh, got five million euros together and bought a Bayraktar drone or two uh, a few months back. And so th- these things have a meaningful effect on 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 the war, uh, as you can see here. So that's fantastic. Okay, uh, last two things. Sorry, I always go on too long. 
Um, here is an example of a um, of an artillery hit on a moving tank, right? Which is fantastic because the tank is moving. Now, the reason why I'm just pointing this out is, to me, this is evidence of a precision munition being used, something like an Exc Excalibur, something that can can be affected as its trajectory is still in in motion. The shell, you, you can tell here, there are no other explosions around here. Nothing's being walked in, and this thing is moving. And there's one shot takes it out. If that's the case, it's almost certainly been hit by a precision munition, which are, are very expensive, but we are providing them. Um, and here you can see that's the end of that tank, absolutely taken out. But, yeah, that would have been a much more expensive precision, precision munition. Otherwise, it's complete fluke. Obviously, complete fluke can happen, um, but unlikely. This is a moving target hit by uh, a great drone operator who sends it off in front of it drop for an off-the-shelf drone, dropping um, an improvised munition onto the tank that's moving. That's a great shot. Great shot. I mean, we talked about that. You couldn't do that with artillery. It's much harder to do that from 25 kilometers away. This is somewhat easier. So that's why I think the other one's a precision munition. This one is just dropping um, some kind of mortar shell or something. So there you go. Last thing I'm going to say, cope cages. So you get these pictures of things like that. That is a tank, a Russian tank with a cope cage. These have been observed for months and months and months right from the beginning and this is called slat armor and it's to stop things like rocket propelled grenades but basically it's completely ineffective against things like javelins and laws and, and stugners and other other anti-tank weaponry in fact all you need to do is go and look at cope cages just google it you know metal enclosures with pillows so here's one with literally with pillows on top and random junk on the top installed by russians on the roofs of their tanks in vain hopes of stopping javelins or endlords they don't work but hopefully they offer some emotional support and there are loads of memes to do with cope cages you talk about copium there's, there's a whole you know there's a whole internet thing about cope cages but just just to let you know that here, this is the thing if you see tanks with these things on top they are cope cages to to be extra protection against um you know rpgs and stuff that that come in i think they probably can protect from things like rpgs like rocket rocket pro propelled grenades that might sort of bounce off um but that's not going to do anything against uh more modern high-tech quality uh weaponry like javelins and endlaws anyway there you go thank you so much for your support uh, I know it's been another long one. That's just the way it goes. You can always listen to me on two times speed. Please do that. And um, uh, please like, subscribe, share. Uh, you can join. You can support with thanks or buy me a coffee. It's all down in the description below. Check out my article. And uh, until tomorrow or later, goodbye.